I'll call the uh, September 8, 2015 study session of the Newport Beach City Council to order. Can we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Petros hmm. is currently absent. Okay, first item of business today is clarification of items on the consent calendar. Council Member Muldoon? No. Council Member Duffy? No. Council Member Curry? No. Council Member Piotr? None. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon? None. And I have none. Okay, we'll move to uh, study session item number two. Um, this is always a favorite time of year uh, for council. It's kind of like Christmas. We always wonder, you know, how much that big check's going to be. So, uh, Tim, would you like to come forward, please? Well, thanks for, uh, very much, Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'm here tonight to introduce Amy Hunt, who's the president of the Friends of the Library, and she would like to uh, present the library with the Friends an uh, um, annual gift. And this is, it. This is Amy. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Amy Hunt, and I'm my third month as president of the Friends of the Newport Beach Library. And as you know, we run our wonderful bookstore downstairs in the main off the main lobby of the library, and this check has been accomplished through lots of sales of dollar books, and two for a dollar book, so a lot of hard work went into it. We have quarterly sales, we have special sales, and I wanna do a great thank you to Tim in addition to the check. He's been so wonderfully supportive of any time we've wanted to piggyback onto a city event like Art in the Park or the juried art exhibition, and we've had booths out there selling books or special lobby sales from Overage from our book sales, and he's been wonderfully cooperative. So we really appreciate the support. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, you guys work so hard to um, present this check to us every year, and, uh, you know, the money goes to make our library uh, an even greater library than it already is, and it's uh, certainly appreciated by the entire city council and uh, the community as well, and uh, we know you really work hard to uh, generate that money, so thank you so much. Well, thank you. We are all volunteers, and we appreciate all donations, and thank you for your support. Okay, step over here. We'll take a photograph. Oh, uh, yes, the amount is $205,000. So that's, uh, that's a lot of dollar and two dollar books. So thank you so much. Um, our next presentation is uh, also dealing with the library and this is uh, Literacy Awareness Day. And it's a proclamation. And uh, is Cheryl Weiss here? Is, uh, who's here from the library? Okay, I'm going to read the proclamation. Whereas the need for a highly literate citizenry is necessary as Newport Beach moves toward an increasingly challenging future, and whereas approximately 10% of the residents of Newport Beach and many of the adults employed within the city are lacking the literacy skills necessary to meet these challenges, and whereas lack of literacy skills impacts not only their lives and the lives of their families, but their ability to work productively and their full participation as citizens, residents, and employees of our city. And whereas Newport uh, Mesa Pro Literacy, a program of the Newport Beach Public Library works with adults seeking to develop their literary skills to empower them to achieve greater success in their lives at home, at work, and in the community. And whereas Newport Mesa Pro Literacy, a program of the Newport Beach Public Library hosts an annual International Literacy Day event to highlight the importance of literacy in society and the great strides the program participants have made. Now, therefore, I, Edward Selich, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, do hereby proclaim September the 10th, 2015, is Literacy Awareness Day in the City of Newport Beach 
and urge my fellow citizens to learn more about the importance of literacy and to become involved with literacy in the community. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Newport Beach to be affixed this 11th day of August, 2015. Do you have a few comments you'd like to make? Absolutely do. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Uh, it's fortuitous. Can that you introduce yourself oh. for the audience, please? I am Cheryl Weiss. I'm the literacy coordinator of Newport Mesa Pro Literacy, a program of the Newport Beach Public Library. Um, today it's fortuitous that we're doing this presentation because it's actually International Literacy Day, a day proclaimed by the United Nations in 1965 to celebrate and recognize the plight of people who don't have literacy skills. We are celebrating International Literacy Day on Thursday, September 10th, and naturally you're all invited to attend what is um, a very moving and uplifting event at the library where we recognize all the accomplishments of our learners. So if anybody's available on the 10th, on the 10th at 10 a.m., please come. In 2015, uh, we helped 200 adult learners work towards their goals. Goals like getting a driver's license, becoming a citizen, or even helping a child read a book. These dreams would not be reached without the help of over 150 volunteers in our program who contributed 9,098 hours of volunteer time. The year was also very good financially. As you know, for the past few years, we've been doing a check presentation here as well. But this past year, we had a very successful um, fundraising luncheon the mayor was at. And we are grateful for all the support that that luncheon brought us. And we have enough money in our coffers this year that we do not have to do the presentation this year. So that's really nice. Um, we're always very grateful for your support and the support of the council and the city and the library and its support groups. And I think that together we really help to make this community more cohesive by giving opportunities to all the people who live in our fair city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you'll step over to the flag, we'll take a photograph. I just have to say that program is so impressive. I know at the literacy luncheon this year and as well as at the past events I've attended, the, uh, the stories that are told by the participants are so inspiring and the uh, impact this program has made on their lives to see people who you know, had limited liter literacy skills that were able to improve them to uh, improve their job opportunities or just their basic quality of life. So the program is just doing tremendous work and thank you so much. Okay, our next item is um, the Newport Sister City Association. We're going to get an update on their activities and also what's going on with the uh, Antibes 29th or 25th anniversary celebration. Jack is handing out some packets that we'll, we'll kind of go through. Good afternoon, um, Mayor uh, Selleck, council members, and staff. Thank you for this opportunity to come and give you an update on the Newport Beach Sister City Association. My name is Sherry Penny Myers. I'm vice president of uh, Newport Beach Sister City, along with Connie Skiba. I'm in charge of the Antibes Committee, and Connie is in charge of the Okazaki Committee. And Jack is one of our student reps from Newport Harbor High School. The mission of the Newport Beach Sister City Association is to create and strengthen partnerships between the city of Newport Beach and its sister cities, to increase awareness and participation at the municipal level, 
promote cultural understandings and motivate and empower private citizens, city officials, and business leaders to conduct long-term programs of mutual interest. Newport Beach Sister City Association and Antibes Jumelage, uh, France, have just celebrated 25 years of friendship. We just came back in July from our visit, and I'm very thankful that Diane Dixon could be part of that celebration. I'm sorry that you missed all the fun, Mayor Selleck. <laughs> Not as um, sorry as I am. <laughs> Jumelage means twinning, and so theirs is called Jumelage Antibe um, Joan Le Pen. Mayor Selleck and MB and Newport Beach Sister City was invited to come to Antibes for the celebration on July 7th for the 25th anniversary. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Diane Dixon was able to share in the French hospitality. The 25th celebration was a theme with country style dancing and later in the evening Hawaiian dancing plus a DJ who played several American pop music for us to dance and a very nice meal. And in your packet, you'll see um, there's pictures on the left-hand side. And um, on the second page, there's different um, pictures of us at that celebration, it's pages um, two and three. As chair of the committee, I helped to facilitate, facilitate uh, different types of exchanges with Antibes. With this visit, a music director from Corona Del Mai High School, Mandrigal Singers, Andrew Ball, uh, came for a few days. His um, Mandrigal Singers will be going to um, France in February uh, 2016. They will be making a stop on February 17th to Antibes um, and be performing at one of the cathedrals. So there's a picture, that first page shows a picture of the cathedral next to the um, city hall. That might be one of their venues that they're going to be performing. We met with the priests and reviewed two cathedral that they might be presenting at. Diane, uh, Melanie, and I met with the fire department that had expressed an interest in an exchange with three to five firefighters to learn from us certain skills from the Newport Beach Fire Department. I have been in communication with Fire Assistant Chip Duncan in regards to this exchange. There is interest with a few of the Newport Beach fire personnel. One of the Antibes firefighter has been on the fire department exchanges with San Francisco, Los Angeles City, and New York fire departments. There is much to work out before this would be able to occur. And um, I thank you, Diane, for taking part in that uh, meeting with us. That, that picture is on um, the very last page, top picture. <clears throat> Our last meeting was with a private school, um, uh, Mount St. Jean High School, and we were meeting with the English teacher there. We have not had a student exchange, a high school student exchange since 2009. 2010, we did have a junior high um, basketball exchange. So Antib is a little bit behind from what Okazaki Committee does because they continue to have um, junior high exchanges through all the years here. So we have much to work out, but they're looking for the dates of October 2016 and February 2017. So that school year is what we're projecting to hopefully restart our high school exchange if all works out there. Coming up now, we have our 25th anniversary celebration. A group of 18 delegates will be arriving from Antibes on October 26. Um, we will be having a week worth of activities. Um, on 26th of October, we will be having our, our actual anniversary celebration at the Newport Theater off of Cliff Drive and the Mandrigal Singers will be performing that night. We'll have a variety of different events that the council will be invited to to join us to help to, to get to know some of the um, delegates, 18 delegates from France. The Library and Arts Commission will be allowing us to do a um, display box um, for the month of October, and so we've collected a lot of um, Antibes items to place there. So in your packet here, there's several pictures. Um, there's a picture of uh, Diane in the city council chambers, which we got to visit. Um, the one picture where Diane is behind um, the councilwoman, Alexis Masana, and um, 
Mr. Rambo is the deputy mayor. Alexis and um, I don't know if Mayor Selleck, if you received the letter yet, but I received the letter that they won't be able to attend the two city officials. So we're a little bit disappointed about that, but Mr. Wolfberg has been leading the delegation for many years, so he will be a very appropriate person we will be dealing with. Our last day there, the last picture above the fire, below the fire department was um, the Lions Club dinner that they invited us to go to and attend, and some, some of the participants, Jack played bull, which is like bocce ball apparently. I was not very successful, my team did not win. But um, in there, I had listed a lot of the different activities that we did while we were there. There's a page, and at the very back of the page, there's some tentative um, things that will be happening. So October 27th, we're looking for that day in the daytime to be able to have them come and tour the city grounds here, meeting um, some of the officials here. but also coming to the evening because they'll probably want to do a presentation to the council. Um, but we have a variety of stuff that might be shifting going. Um, Mr. Berg is a pastry chef and so we're trying to get him into this uh, culinary school at Newport Harbor High to um, show some of his skills with pastry to the students. Um, and then again, like I said, the 29th will be our big celebration for the 25th anniversary. I have also put in there an article that was written in the Newport Magazine back in June um, also, our membership stuff that also tells about our mission. And some previous um, articles that I've copied um, that were about the French Committee. Because when we first started in 1989, there was 32 members of Newport Beach uh, that went to, including um, council members that went to Antibes to formulate our original um, setting up of the twinning of the cities. We are 31 years strong. Um, Okazaki was 30 years last year. Again, I thank you for your time. Um, Connie will speak with you briefly and Jack, and then I'm sure Diane may have some questions for us and anybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for your time. Um, I'm Connie Skeba, and I've been heading up the Okazaki Committee for a few years. and. Not quite as organized as Sherry, but I'm going to pass, I've made one copy. I, I want to pass this picture around for one reason. We have been sister cities, Newport Beach and Okasaki for 31 years. And we have, we have had an exchange for 30 years. And I'm very proud of that. We've only missed one year due to a flu ep ep epidemic, I think. But anyway, the bottom picture of all the kids jumping up, that's in Kyoto. And it just shows you how happy our kids were this year to be in Kyoto. The top picture is a picture when they were in um, Okasaki. But this is a fabulous program, and we have appreciated your help in the past. Uh, we appreciate any help we get to keep this program going. Uh, the parents, the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, the whole total family reaches out. This, this really does affect a lot of families and a lot of people in the community. And speaking of community, you'll see we have my, my Okasaki students will be coming um, September 29th to Newport Beach and be going to school at CDM Harbor and Sage. Um, we will be having this famous carving pumpkin party at the park on private road, which we'd love to have you come, even if you could stay a small amount of time. Come when you can and leave when you must. If, if you can come, we would be so happy. Um, the firemen every year, volunteers, cook the hamburgers for us, and the kids perform. The community shows up for this. It's a big event, and this is probably our 30th year of having it in our park. It's a little neighborhood park on private road. Last, I would like to say a big thank you to you because um, this is Shogun Toku, Tokugawa, and which you probably all have seen him, and you had him set in a park over, um, what's the name of Irvine, Irvine Terrace Park, where he rests now, and I went to see him just recently. He looks wonderful. Um, it was a nice place to put him. He's very happy there, and it's because of your effort and uh, Tim at the library that you put together a wonderful presentation, welcoming for him to come to our park last year when the um, officials were here. So I want to thank you especially for that help. Remember to invite you to our party. It's Friday night, October 2nd. And um, if you have any questions about the program, Sherry and I would be most happy to answer any questions. Jack. Oh, uh, Jack would like to speak. <laughs> yes. 
Hello, hello everyone. My name is Jack, and I, I guess I can confirm firsthand that uh, the wonderful experience that I've had working with the, well, it's hardly work going to France, but the wonderful experience I've had going to France with the Sister City Committee and just the, the excellent experience that we received from the city of Antibes itself, uh, certainly I felt very welcome. It was like, it was extremely cool to just go to this totally new city with a, a whole different culture where you can go out at midnight and there's still like tons of old people having parties, young people as well. <laughs> uh, certainly that was, a, that was a great experience and they, they were very welcoming to us. They transported us around numerous times and the event that she described with the country music and people dancing, that was a, that was a lot of fun. And I, it was just, a, a very excellent experience to go to this place, and I really felt like I got a a good taste of France and what it was like, and I, I definitely will be interested in going back there so I can experience it again as a student, as a student exchange and also hopefully as an adult as well. And uh, in addition to that, my friend went on the trip to Japan, and he has also been uh, raving about this to me for numerous years. It's getting a bit annoying, but he he also had an excellent experience, and that is still going on, and hopefully we can get something of a similar caliber going on with Antibes at Newport Harbor because I know that many people would be highly interested in going to France, as I'm sure all of you are as well. So. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Yes, well, thank you. I'm happy to uh, speak and give my thanks and appreciation and compliments to the Sister City Association, Cherry and, and Connie and Jack, thank you for your enthusiastic support. Uh, as I, you know, someone had to go to France, and I guess I had to do it since the mayor couldn't go, so <laughs> it's, it's a tough job. Someone has to do it. Um, I was delighted to represent the city. It's kind of Newport Beach diplomacy, and so I was honored to step in the mayor's shoes. What I was most impressed by, many things I was impressed, and certainly going to France uh, was was a lovely experience because Antibes is very similar to Newport Beach in many ways in terms of the harbor and private boating and recreational activities. But I was most impressed by the fact that the Sister City Organization is a volunteer organization. No taxpayer dollars, general fund dollars, are, are used to support your activities. You travel on your own expense, uh, you, uh, you get around France or Japan on your own expense, and uh, the city's involvement is very nominal, just insurance-related purposes, as I understand it. I paid my own expenses and was happy to do so. I, it's almost like, a, it is, in my mind, a perfect example of the, the simplicity, the beauty, the wisdom of, of volunteer in action and how great a program can be run by volunteers. And I commend you, Sherry, I know just from talking with you, uh, the many hours that you're devoted to create and foster good working relations, social, cultural relations with our sister city partners. And I'm sure, Connie, you are doing the same. I attended the event last fall when the Japanese were here. And it, it, is, it does tremendous goodwill and at low cost, zero cost to the city, a personal cost to you and your time and treasure and talent, and I appreciate that, and on behalf of the people of Newport Beach, thank you for what you're doing, and Jack, thank you for the spirit of support and good wishes and spreading it amongst your friends. I think, as Sherry and I have discussed, it would be great to uh, re-accelerate or re-inaugurate re the uh, Exchange for the students. We've got some. Other, you've got some other potential cultural and maybe the fire departments, for example, could reciprocate. But it would be great to have a student exchange come back to life. So thank you, Jack, if you could help lead that. But again, thank you for all the good work you do at your own expense, and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll just add that um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend the, the last minute change from the, the end of July till the beginning of July created an unsolvable problem for me. And I'm happy, Diane, that you were able to go and represent the city and thank you so much for doing that. And thank all of you for all the hard work you do in promoting you know, good friendship and relations uh, with our sister cities. It's uh, one of the important things we do. So thank you so much. Okay, our next uh, item is a presentation by the Orange County Sanitation District uh, on the start of 
phase two of the force main project, which I'm sure is not going to be as painful as phase one, correct? It, that is correct. How could it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am Rob Thompson. I'm Director of Engineering for Orange County Sanitation District. Thank you, Mayor Selich and Council Members for the opportunity to give you an update on this very important project. First, a quick word on who we are. Orange County Sanitation District is the regional wastewater uh, provider for all of North Central Orange County. We treat 190 million gallons a day. The efforts of all Orange Countyans to reduce their water use is apparent in our inflow. So we receive 190 million gallons a day, and we recycle 100 million gallons of that to drinking water quality in cooperation with the Orange County Water District. So together, we're probably, in fact, today we are the largest supply of drinking water to North Central Orange County. We have um, 15 pump stations spread throughout our uh, service area, and we have two treatment plants. The majority of the pump stations are in the city, as you can see. Within the city itself, we have significant infrastructure in place. You can see uh, uh, in green are our force mains. Those are pipes that are under pressure. In red, you see gravity sewers that feed our pump stations. And in yellow, you see the pump stations. So almost all of the flow coming into the city, except for that little bit on the extreme north, um, flows through the force mains that we're talking about to our treatment plant in Huntington Beach. We realized some time ago that we had aging infrastructure and we inv have been investing over the last 10 years, but especially in the last five years, to really rework our lines and make sure that we are providing the highest level of service, protecting the environment and protecting the investment that is in the ground here in the city. So we also understood that we couldn't just impact the city all at once and just do the pro uh, projects all at the same time. So we've been working very closely with city staff to sequence through these uh, renewal efforts. So I'm pleased to report that the work on the peninsula, which you see there is 5-47, the Balboa trunk sewer rehabilitation is complete. The Dover Drive trunk sewer rehabilitation in red there um, is also complete. We are 80% done. Phase one was 80% of the work for the Newport force mains. And soon we will be embarking on 617 in purple there which is a line that goes down uh, Newport Boulevard for the city's purposes. There's a little more to the north that isn't included. Uh, that's in the city of Costa Mesa. So with the completion of this work, we will have completely replaced five pump stations on the west side of Newport and all of the uh, at-risk piping, all of the piping um, serving west Newport and uh, flow through from east Newport. So the project at hand, the Newport force main rehabilitation, is really uh, two force mains in parallel. Each of them uh, at the completion of the project will be fully redundant. So what you see in blue is the south force main. That was the focus of the work last year. We have completed that work and that force main is in service right now and has been in service through the summer. The red force main is the north force main. That's the focus of phase two to get that in service and then to abandon the lines uh, that are no longer needed. So phase one, just to refresh your memory, started with a jack and bore technique uh, to get the Lido uh, sewage from the peninsula to our North Force main so we could do the work um, in the first phase. Then the most painful part of the work that you all remember, uh, K-Rail is the watchword here, is all the stuff in green. If you'll notice, there's, a, there's, there's two sections uh, that are side by side uh, around uh, the center of the slide. That is the Mariner's Mile work where we actually installed most of the North Force Main. As long as the trench was open, we dug it up and put two pipes in instead of one. So everything that was done was done to minimize impact. The next piece of the work was cured in place pipe where we actually renew the pipe in place. You pull a uh, felt impregnated uh, liner. It's got epoxy impregnated in it. You pull it through and then heat it up with warm or hot water and you can actually make a new pipe within a pipe. It's much less impactful than the digging that was experienced for the, the green sections, the open cut. All you do is dig uh, trench, uh, I'm sorry, dig pits about six to 800 feet apart and then pull the liner through. So it's a much quicker methodology. 
The last piece was microtunneling, which was an adventure. Uh, we found a lot of buried relics from the city's past. Um, we left most of them in place, but some of them uh, we kept. That was probably the most disruptive and impactful part of phase one in that we had to adjust our methodologies as we came across obstacles that could not easily be located. So I'm pleased to report that that work was all completed. Uh, the pipes are finished and we're off to phase two. Phase two is a much smaller job. Again, it's about 20% of the work. We will be renewing the North Force Main with that cured in place pipe system. And that will go from our Bitter Point uh, pump station at about 60th Street all the way to um, just beyond the Newport Boulevard Bridge. There are two small open cut sections, one uh, to connect the old pipe, which was in service until um, a few weeks ago. So the place there by the winery or A's restaurant, that little green crossing, and then there's another green crossing at Dover. The pipe was extended all the way to the edge of the road, so there shouldn't be a great impact uh, to traffic. On the Dover side, there will be a short impact, uh, relatively speaking, uh, near the winery and A's restaurant. Then there's the abandonment work. This work is the old pipelines that are under the street. They vary from 30-inch pipe to 18-inch pipe. We have to fill those with concrete. You can't just leave an empty pipe. Long term, it will fail and leave a sinkhole in the street, and that's not an acceptable outcome. So we will be digging pits, and I'll show you where those are in a minute. You basically dig the pit, pump the pipe full of uh, uh, low density concrete, and it's abandoned in place rather than digging it up and causing all the mayhem that goes with an open trench. So west of Newport Boulevard, you, you see um, before you those uh, marks with blue. Those are the pit locations that are anticipated. We've worked with our contractor and the city and the design uh, to locate those uh, strategically to be of as small impact as possible. There will be some impacts. There will be short time durations where it's impossible to keep two lanes of traffic in service. We have tried what we can do, but the problem is the pipe as it exists, which was laid 50 plus years ago, is now in the number two lane. So with all the rerouting of the street and the new medians and street expansion over time, the pipe is where the pipe is and we can't really move it. So we're kind of left with um, the work at hand. We do intend to plate uh, the work during rush hour traffic for the most part. There will be those times where you have to erect that big tower and do the pull through, but those tend to be short duration uh, weekend operations where they're curing the pipe in place. As we move to the Mariner's Mile, again, you can see the uh, finish of the cure in place pipe work uh, near the bridge. There's two pits on this side of the, the bridge. There's the small open cut piece, but then those red triangles are the pits to abandon the existing pipe. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're going to use manholes uh, to uh, minimize the impact to the greatest extent possible but that is the work of phase two. Um, there's really no way around accessing the pipe where it is and it tends to cross lanes uh, the way it was laid back uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Last piece is on the end with the open trench work. Again, most of that is gonna be off to the side in the shoulder of the road. Uh, we went all the way to the end uh, in phase one all that's left is the tie-in. We couldn't do that because uh, the North Force Main was in service at the time. So with that, I'll leave you with the slide, which is really the point of the project. Our job is to make sure that doesn't happen again. This pipe did fail once in uh, 1981. It was a problem. And our job is to make sure that uh, we don't make the front page in the same way. With that, I can answer any questions you might have. Hey, thank you. That was a good... Uh Good description of the sequence of events. Any questions from council? Okay, don't see any. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mayor, if I could just comment on that at the end here. Um, just so the audience knows, we are working on Dover Drive right now, and that is the bypass for this project. That project is mostly done. We've paved from West Cliffs up to uh, Irvine Avenue right now. Uh, we should be done with that first part of October, and that will relieve some of the congestion as this project ramps up. Okay. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Uh, Dave, 
uh, as a resident of Lido, we received uh, an advisory that there's going to be some Lido area sewer work. And I understood that to be starting approximately now as well. So uh, could you describe what we're going to be experiencing as we cross over Newport Boulevard and go on to Coast Highway? <laughs> Yes, it, and it's unfortunate we have several projects in this area and, and the sanitation district projects, the, the big one that we're dealing with, but we've been trying to wrestle in other needed projects at the same time. So I mentioned Dover Drive, that's about done. We are just about to kick off a water main replacement, the main water main that feeds the peninsula, and we'll be starting at Via Lido and going down to basically 19th Street down in that area. So we'll be replacing that up through the winter, and then come after Christmas time, we'll start the widening project right around 32nd Street. So you will have some impacts there that will be keeping hopefully traffic most of the time in the uh, computer hours open, but there will be some impacts in that area. Okay, thank you. Before we leave this, Mr. Mayor, so Dave with Rob here, could you kind of describe what folks will see over the next few months in terms of how many lanes open, especially in Mariner's Mile? Um, and I'll let Rob speak to the specifics. We're trying to keep two lanes in each direction open at all times, but there are cases, as Mr. Thompson mentioned, that we're going to have to get down to one lane. Uh, we're going, going to try to do the cast or cure in place over some of the weekend times, maybe starting at night and when it's less impactful, but there will be some impacts at different locations on Mariner's Mile. Rob, you might point out where or, you're going to Is that pipe in the westbound or the eastbound lane? Westbound side, I believe. And that's... That's the key. When you talk about the Mariner's Mile section, we'll have both <clears throat> because we're abandoning both the North Force main sections and the South Force main sections. Uh, we, I believe we intend to do them one and then the other, um, but we're going to sequence our traffic control so that we're off during peak hours to the greatest extent possible. So for the southbound or eastbound traffic, depending on what you call it, we'll avoid the morning hours. And for the north or westbound, we'll avoid the afternoon hours. All of those restrictions have been worked very carefully with the city and Caltrans. It will have some impacts. And again, Dover will have, be down to one lane in each direction up to Westcliff till about October at times. Okay. Um, very good. Thank you. Okay. Any public comment on this item? Please come forward. Okay. Seeing no one, we'll move on to study session item number six. It's the John Wayne Settlement Agreement Amendment regarding the noise monitoring station technology. Mr. Kiff. Back to the right page here. So it's ready, Leilani. So um, we were hopeful we would have uh, Vince Mestry here with Landerman Brown to make this presentation, but Vince has been sick. So um, I do have a lot of good folks in here to support me in making this presentation. I'm basically going over what he gave to the Aviation Committee. So uh, we have uh, Eric Freed and Courtney Weirchuk from the county, as well as our own consultant, Tom Edwards, um, our, our own noise expert, and I'm going to mention uh, Gene's role in this in just a moment, and then Aaron and I will try to take any questions you might have. But this is, this, you'll see the same presentation that the Citizens Aviation Committee saw in August, thus the date of this report. It's also in your packet. Before I begin, there are three things going on with John Wayne Airport right now that are getting people's awareness. One is the issue that I'm going to cover today, and that is the changing of noise monitoring microphones, as well as a requirement that we change the limits in the, in the settlement agreement. So that's one thing. The second thing is there's a, uh, when back in September of 2014, when the, air, when the FAA reacted to changes in polarity of the earth, as it does every 10 to 12 years, um, the, the runway designations at John Wayne got new numbers. And they also then, as I understand it, and this is the layperson's understanding, they, um, the FAA in this case uh, reissued flight departure patterns for John Wayne, and we think there was an error in one of those that leads flights to go too far to the west. So over West Cliff, in some cases, in, in most cases Dover Shores, even a little bit over Lido, more than we would prefer. In, in fact, more than the 
it, it's different from the historical patterns of the Bay. So that's a second thing that's going on, and um, we can talk more about how that's being corrected. The third thing that's going on, and it has nothing to do with this first two, is that the FAA region-wide is working on changing the uh, airspace departures and arrivals nationwide. It's called NextGen. And right now, actually today, is the last day that comments are open on an, env an environmental assessment, an EA, that's done that tries to, um, where, where the FAA tried to explain how these changes will affect everyone. We sent you a copy of that letter. Uh, that that's, the letter's available to the public. And basically, we, we do have some strong concerns about the EA, the environmental assessment. Um, but this effort overall is an attempt to narrow flight paths for John Wayne's purposes down the historic paths of the bay. And specifically, that's kind of down the middle of the upper bay with one turn, and then you go over the Newport Dunes mound, as I call it, that mound that's across from Back Bay Cafe. And basically, the concept that the FAA is working on is to narrow all those flights down, basically that path, that pattern. Then it, you go it offshore and you turn. And that's good for some people and bad for others. It's not good if you live under the narrowed flight path because you would see more flights. If you were under a, one of the old flight paths that may be discarded or not used anymore, uh, that's a better thing for you. Um, as we've seen that environmental assessment, that new narrowed flight path, at least what's being described, appears to be the correct one, not the mistaken one that was caused by the magnetic polarity change. So those are the three things that are going on, again, all pretty much unrelated to each other. So I know you're getting a lot of emails and questions about each one of those three things. I'm gonna talk about the first one. So um, when, when Vince gave this presentation, he put a big cla black cloud over everything, and that is the Airport no Noise and Capacity Act, or ANCA, passed in 1990. In part, uh, he uses the quote that when, when ANCA was passed uh, in Congress, the, word, the phrase John Wayne Airport was used frequently, as in we do not want, we Congress, do not want things like what has happened at John Wayne where the localities agreed to control noise. We, want, we do not want that to happen nationwide. So we, do, we refer to the John Wayne Airport Settlement Agreement and its amendments as being grandfathered in under ANCA. But ANCA did pass and we need to know it's out there. We need to recognize it's out there. But it is the cloud over these 10 noise monitoring stations uh, there are seven on the south side. You can kind of see where they are. They're kind of set up in triangles, at least two of them are, uh, where the plane is intended to fly over the center one, but you're supposed to measure the noise on the side ones. Um, there's three on the arrival corridor. And these uh, noise monitors are set within the settlement agreement. They're described within the settlement agreement and thresholds by which a plane can fly at or below a decibel level at each noise monitor is set in the settlement agreement. Uh, this is what they look like. Uh, this is the one that's uh, closer to Newport Beach Golf Course, and uh, Vince gave this diagram as an example of what I'm gonna talk about next, and that is the swap out of 20-year-old um, equipment. You can see there is the old microphone, which is there. If my uh, diagram, things, my clicker is gonna point. And then, come on there. And then the new microphone is two feet away from it. So um, I'm gonna talk next about the side-by-side -side testing that developed this. So that's what the, the noise monitoring stations actually look like. So this is, what it, uh, th this is what's in uh, both the settlement agreement and the phase two access plan for the county where it says that there is, there, there, remember there are a couple of classes of flights. I would just refer to the class A flights as the loudest flights. The class E flights are quieter. You can sell, tell from the decibel level. Um, these are the seven noise monitoring stations that affect Newport the most, and these are the, the levels, they're single event noise equivalent levels. Sorry, I always mispronounce that, but they're single event levels. So one plane has to be, each plane has to be below those caps in order to successfully use John Wayne Airport. There are similar decibel levels for general aviation, and these are those. So what I showed you before were the 
the daytime levels. These are the nighttime levels. So um, this is why we refer to the curfew as a noise-based curfew. If you're a plane that can get out below these levels, you can fly, if you're given permission to take off, before 7 o'clock. And these are generally the JV, general aviation planes that can get out below these levels. But you can see how the curfew itself is tied to levels that are louder during the day and quieter at night. So the county did a, a, what we, we're gonna, I'm going to refer to as a side-by-side -side test. And it said that for three months, it picked four sites. And it said that it put one, an old microphone next to a new microphone. And what it found was that, um, actually, this slide, ta ta let, me, let me back up. This slide talks more about w what we're seeing in the modern environment with modern jet planes is they're flying at about this much below those uh, station thresholds. So you could see at station one and two, there's a healthy margin. Station three is the closest one where almost all the flights, they're all flying below it, but they're only flying about 1.2 decibels below it. And then you can see as they get out to 4S, 5S, 6S, and 7S, you're getting to be, the flights are much quieter than the limit itself, in this case, the class E limit. But you can see that for Class A operations, the typical margin, as it's described, is about from three decibel levels to 12 decibel levels. Actually, he doesn't have that diagram, but that's about what we're seeing. In other words, this is the example of the MD-80. When the MD-80 flew out of John Wayne Airport in the 80s and 90s, it was, gonna, it was the quietest plane out there. Now it's the loudest plane out there, and it almost never flies out of John Wayne anymore. And a lot of these noise standards were based on the MD-80 and planes that were flown at the time. What, um, what's different about these microphones now is it's a different type of pickup. So um, I'm not going to go into the details, but our noise consultant can, if, if this is above, above my understanding of things, at least to describe it to you. But uh, please ask this question of, of Gene or Eric or Courtney, if you'd like. Uh, this sheet is a little challenging to read, but uh, basically it talks about when we did the side-by-side, -side, that far column over there is the variation in what the two microphones were picking up. The newer microphones are picking up a little bit more decibel level than the old microphones even side-by-side. -side. And to me, that's like um, if I'm watching my weight and I'm standing on two scales, and the more modern scale is the one that's picking up my true weight. It doesn't mean that the planes are any louder. The planes are the same planes. It's the same plane, same day, same flight, same exact thing, just being measured more precisely. And the decibel level ranges from about 0.3 to 0.4 or 5 or 6, in some cases 9, depending on the station, decibel levels higher. And uh, this is an, from the analysis that Landerman Brown did. It just kind of shows that about what those decibel level changes were. So uh, Vince would talk, if he were here, he'd talk about uh, the different things that affect this from good calibration. Uh, we believe the old system was well calibrated. It was tested all the time. Uh, it seems like the big difference is a better microphone. And again, to emphasize that this did not represent an increase in noise. This represented an increase in the reading of each event. The same, the same uh, flight was putting out the same noise energy, though. So uh, putting back on that ANCA cloud, ANCA says that we cannot enact, that, that no locality, including our own, even with a grandfather John Wayne settlement agreement, can and can uh, apply a noise limit that's more stringent than the noise limit that was in place before. So what's happened here is we've been able to measure it better, and uh, that's resulted in a slightly higher no reading, uh, noise reading. But we can't go back to the old reading knowing that there's a technology that reads it better and more accurately. So what all the legal counsel in this room and lots outside the room say is, just like the city did in, I think, 1997, we have to adjust the noise limits to reflect the better technology. And that means a slight increase 
in the class A limits and the class E limits. And you could see how those would go up on this chart. Uh, there, it also applies to the general aviation limits. Again, this is about a 0.4 to a 0.7 increase in those. Um, this would be something that our noise monitor can talk about more than I could. Um, with that, I'd, I'd certainly welcome your questions. I'd note that um, the city is the third entity to review this. The fourth entity would be the County of Orange, and the County of Orange is scheduled to do it this month. The airport working group and stop polluting our Newport, who are other signatories to the settlement agreement, have signed off on this change. And uh, that's the recommendation for your council tonight is to agree to have the city's agreement that these noise limits could be changed in, in the settlement agreement and therefore could be changed in the phase two access plan. So with that, I'd welcome your questions and I, I know I'm gonna punt to the experts when they get too technical. Okay, thank you, Dave. Are there any questions from council? Okay, uh, public comments. Anybody wanna comment on this item? Please come forward. Mayor Selich and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. I think it must be obvious to everybody that the airport has expanded vastly in the last 50 years. And as I've told past councils, we frequently pat ourselves on the back for having a settlement agreement, but the settlement agreement seems to be a moving target. And in fact, it seems that every time the airport bumps up against one of the limits in the agreement, the limit in the agreement conveniently is moved so that it no longer acts as a constraint on the airlines. With regard to the capacity limits, how many planes, how many passengers can fly out of the airport, we have been forced into those changes as a condition for extension of the settlement agreement. But the noise limits that are in the settlement agreement have mysteriously gone up at times when I believe we had no compulsion, no requirement to change the limits that we had rigorously worked out and agreed to for the benefit of the residents of Newport Beach. Uh, this morning I prepared a little chart showing how those limits have gone up over the years. The, these are absolute noise limits in decibels that are being enforced. The numbers have gone up. We're told that this is to maintain parity. If we were truly maintaining parity, matching old readings with new readings, there would be times that the readings would be going up, going down. You will notice that they always invariably go up, and there's a good reason why they always invariably go up. The reason is Mr. Mestre, the county's uh, noise consultant, cherry picks from the data those few flights that are closest to the limit, the ones that have difficulty meeting our settlement agreement, and then he applies the adjustment necessary to give them the same margin that they had to all the planes. And although we hear the planes are getting quieter, we hear it may be that the average noise levels are going down, we're allowing higher absolute noise levels. We're allowing, if they wish, for the planes to fly noisier than they have in the past. Again, I feel we have no compulsion to do that. Unlike when we're asking or begging for an extension of our settlement agreement, I believe in this case we are in the driver's seat. The county, not wanting too close a scrutiny of what they're doing, is wanting us to change the limits. And if we're willing to do that, they are small changes. I think we should ask for some concession in return for doing it. A very simple concession that we might ask for is for a real-time posting of the noise readings that we are getting from these new monitors so that the public can see those. The county, to its credit, has through the airport, has been doing a very good job of showing the flight tracks and the altitudes. I would think we might ask that they tell us what the noise readings are as well so that the public can tell whether their perception of the noise agrees with what the county is using or not. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Please come forward and state your name. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Hansen, and I live on Balboa Island. I was reading in the pilot the other day, which generated me coming to the meeting today, and it looks like the FAA, with their new system, wants to spread the way the airplanes take off. And maybe everybody in Newport Beach then would uh, have a little bit of that noise rather than 100% of it going over Balboa Island. Now, I'm not sure if that's what they're trying to accomplish, but it seems like that would be a, 
This well, is fair. strictly talking about the noise monitors, not the takeoff patterns. We're not Are talking about the same. We're not talking about takeoff patterns. We're talking about the noise monitors and the decibel readings. Yes. Two different subjects. Two different subjects. You going to bring the other one up today? Not today. No. No. Do we know I, when? I'd be happy, Gary, to talk with you about it separately. I know it, it's an important issue that Balboa Island's facing. So, thank you. Okay. Any other comments on this item? Please come forward. Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back to council. Um, you know, yeah. Aaron, if you might want to comment more, Gene, about what Mr. Mosier raised. I think that's important to address that. Well, I mean, just briefly, the equipment's gotten better over time, and it's important to maintain parity between the system. You know, basically what you have is new equipment that measures noise better than the old equipment. We went out there and did sufficient tests, and we had an independent noise expert take a look at it as well, and he confirmed that the analysis is appropriate and basically you're not generating you're not getting more noise you basically have better equipment that can read it better i don't know if you need any uh, having kind of like uh, recalibrating the speedometer in your car in some ways okay uh council member piotr uh, dave either webb or kiff uh so we have better equipment that can measure it better why is it that the standards change then why can't we still hold the same standards because the new equipment is actually measuring a more true reading? Because the argument would be that the older limits, had they been read with the new equipment, would have also been higher. And that if we know that that's a possibility, we can't keep a law, sorry, we can't keep a settlement agreement that is, has ar arbitrarily reduced the noise from what we know the noise limit should be because of ANCA. If ANCA didn't exist, we could certainly do that. So the EPA sits there and measures parts per million and then they start reading parts per billion and they change the standards all the time. Um, I guess the question comes down, it, the 100 you know, dBs that we had in there, was that a, I mean, it's, it's rounded off. It sounds to me like that was the goal. It was a hypothetical, we don't want to be over 100 dBs because then you start to have, you know, affect hearing and other things that can happen. So if, you know, if the 100 that we came to was calculated based on what the max should be, not what it currently is and we want to keep it the same, it seems to me that if you have better reading equipment, you ought to hold them to the same standard. I mean, because it, it was a calculated standard, 100, 100 dBs. It wasn't, you know, an arbitrary, let's hold it at the current level, or else it would have said, you know, 102.3, whatever it was at the existing point. So if, if we've got better equipment that measures it more accurately, and it was it, the 100 dBs came from a theoretical calculation, I don't know why we change it. Tom may have Tom Edwards have, may have more information on this than I do, but my understanding is that the original standards were based on what the noise was being generated and the equipment available to measure it at the time. And as the equipment's changed over time, it's keeping the standard the same. It's just measuring it with the newer equipment. Was my understanding? It wasn't quite as arbitrary as that. Uh, we we think, as you were mentioning, Mr. Piotr, we we do think it was a a calculated, thoughtful, measured assignment back when this was written and that we have to be respectful of that. And again, Tom may have another perspective on it or more information about how that's developed. None of us were around in 85. But. Uh, yeah, I would like to hear it from an acoustical engineer's perspective. Or, Tom, you want to come in and comment on that? And then uh, maybe if Gene has a perspective, that would help too. Good afternoon, Council. Um, uh, state your name. Thomas Edwards. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite understanding the question, but uh, you sort of have to look at this in the historical perspective of 85 and a variety of changes. And a lot of these changes, contrary to what has been asserted here, had nothing to do with what the county wanted. And uh, I'll, let me just talk uh, particular. In 92, there were two uh, test periods mandated by the FAA as a result of complaints by uh, some of the aircraft operators, principally Delta Airlines. And so uh, the city then had, or the city, the county, uh, through the auspices of both the FAA and airlines, then went about 
testing airlines. And that that uh, ended up in with what is called uh, 9153A, which is the current cutback procedure that you have at the airport. It used to be we had a 500-foot cutback procedure. You know, they would take off, and at 500 feet, they would so-called cut the power. That that went to 800. That is not a mandatory procedure. It's whether or not you can meet the noise monitors. So that changed what was imposed out there. And there was a period of tests uh, in 92. Um, and then you ha also then had a combination in 1979. You had an old monitoring system, which then got replaced in 97. That's the one that more deals with the uh, current situation of trying to establish uh, the so-called parity. What you're having is that whether or not the noise, uh, it, the noise is what it is. It's just being registered with new equipment and read differently. One reads it as, we'll say, one, and the other one reads it one plus one. And so the problem going back to ANCA is that under ANCA, you cannot have an agreement, even though our, our agreement, when I talk about our agreement, I'm talking about the John Wayne Settlement Agreement, you have an agreement which is grandfathered in under the law. ANCA came into effect in 1990. ANCA uh, dealt with certain restrictions of the airport. The settlement agreement was 85. Even though we were grandfathered in, you cannot have an agreement which further limits or restricts access to an airport. So the argument then becomes, out of an abundance of caution by uh, counsel involved in, in this matter, is that you have essentially, if you are flying out today, and let's assume it's the old equipment, and the limit at monitor number one is one. This is just hypothetical. And now with the new equipment, it reads 1.5. The plane is taking off and it's been able to operate. And so if you left the monitor reading at one as opposed to what it is now registering at 1.5, that plane couldn't leave any longer. And so you would be restricting access under ANCA. That's sort of how that came about. Does that respond to your question better? Well, certainly I don't want to sit there and jeopardize our settlement agreement because it is grandfathered in. But if the design of the the intent under the settlement agreement was 100 dBs, and that we can now measure 100 dBs better, then why shouldn't you use the new microphones and the new dBs? I understand the concept of not making it more restrictive, but I would posit to you that we're not making it more restrictive. We're just bringing it into alignment with what was the original intent of the agreement. Well, if you go back to the original agreement, it, it doesn't talk in terms of what the so it, it talks about energy levels as measured by the noise monitoring equipment. That's in the agreement. So it's okay. As so measured. it wasn't a design of 100 dB. It was a design of 100 dB with these parameters. Right. So as so we measured. Do as measured. So you're having the exact same noise, it's just now that it's measured. I, I can't speak for Mr. Mestri, but I did ask the question, and Gene may want to speak to this, but I asked the very same question which has been raised. Had the readings showed lower, would they have lowered the monitors? And the answer is yes. They would have lowered the, the restriction. The reading. The right. reading. Yeah. Not the energy level, the reading on the energy level. Because that's all sound is, as you're aware. I understand. I understand the dilemma that we're in. I'm. I'm just wondering if there's, if we have an avenue to push this as a design level of 100 dB was the intent of the agreement. We're not making it more restrictive. We just can measure it better. Well, uh, I can't speak for everybody at the table in '85, but it wasn't the concept of, of the intent. It was as measured at that time. And so, well, what you have now is uh, equipment which can now measure the exact same sound is just registering a different amount. In effect, we got locked in. The intent was 100 dBs, but it, we got locked in based on the quality or ability of our equipment to measure that. Well, I wouldn't say it was the so-called intent. I would say that that's, what the, it, that's how it was measured, and that was, that, that was the standard, the standard of measurement. And as regards some of the other changes in response to something Mr. Moser mentioned, also... Uh, in 2003, when the settlement agreement was amended, which uh, allowed for the now or the then current 10.8 map, et cetera, uh, there was also eliminated what was called a second class. There used to be class A, then there was class AA and class E. 
class AA was eliminated. It no longer applied because there weren't all these differentiations in terms of aircraft out there. So has Delta gotten their act together since they were complaining before? Uh, you'll, you tell me when you take off. And, it's, and as uh, a lot of people know, a lot of the planes no longer use the cutback because the, uh, the sound has gotten so much better, they don't need to. All they have to do is comply with the, uh, the noise monitors. Hey, they've gotten better equipment. It seems like they should match the original intent. Anyway, I understand what you're okay. saying. Thank you. Thank you. I guess the way I look at this is um, there was a Stop certain... Away. Pardon me? I'm sorry. Go ahead. He's going to ask you a question. I want to make a comment first. Uh, the way that I um, look at it is a certain noise was agreed to back then, and now we just have a different way of measuring it. Going back to my speedometer analogy, it's like having the uh, speedometer that reads in miles per hour and kilometers per hour. You're still going the same speed. The noise level is still the same, whether you're using one scale or the other to uh, to measure it. So we're still having the the same noise, it just has a different way of measuring it because of the new equipment. And the, and the key is if, if you believe, as we do, because we've looked at it, that there is a direct link that goes as far back to 1985 to those same noise events, that it's being measured better and better, and that this new decibel level in the settlement agreement reflects the same noise event as it would have occurred in 85. It's just a more precise number. One other thing I forgot to add. Uh, there was, I, th I think it was in 99, there, they also moved some of the noise monitors as a result of all the noise testing, et cetera. And I can comment that the community weighed in very heavily. I know uh, Clem Shute, who represented Spawn and AWG, actually lodged letters with the FAA because the, uh, the community actually favored a 1,500-foot cutback because it felt that downstream the noise... Uh, uh, relief would be much greater. Uh, the FAA and or the, the county weighed in, I think, a little differently, but that's the way it is. And going, going back to something you said, uh, council member, and it, and it sort of goes to, you know, the council obviously has to decide which way they want to go. I guess the real question is, and I'm looking at it, trying to look at it somewhat objectively, do you want to risk uh, a potential violation of ANCA and having an airline jump in and say, you know, we're, we're going to take a whole, a big look at the settlement agreement. Councilman McCurry, you have a question? Well, Tom, that's sort of uh, my question. I mean, the reason why we're being asked to do this is because of the potential that if we don't do this, we open the door for someone to go to court and seek to invalidate the settlement agreement. I mean, is that basically the issue? I, I think so, but I defer to the city attorney on that. He's not, and he said that he seems to think so, too. Well, well, that's correct. I mean, I think the point of amending the settlement agreement is that you're trying to say that we're not going to be more restrictive and have a lower number than basically what was being measured before the equipment changed. So you don't want to open a door for someone to potentially challenge uh, the settlement agreement, and that's why we're going forward with the stipulation to amend it. Okay. And, and I suspect that's why, Tom, the thoughtful people who are community activists in the airport working group and, and stop polluting our new port and spawn, who, which is through airfare, have looked at this and they support this uh, this modification. Is that the testimony that I heard? That, that's right. They've already approved the amendment to the settlement agreement. And I think it is important to note that we do have, have Gene here, who is a noise expert, who basically okay. went th through all the reports and, and verified that the what was being presented by the county is accurate. So for all the people watching who are highly sensitized now to the airport, because I think a lot of emails have gone out, you know, saying call your councilman, who, and we have no ability to really address this issue on their behalf with the FAA, because after the planes take off, they're, they, they never were in our jurisdiction, but now they're in the FAA's jurisdiction. This is a way to protect our curfew, to protect the landing rest, uh, uh, restriction in the evening, to keep planes from taking off at 7 o'clock. And to lock that in further from a potential challenge from the airlines without in any way uh, uh, causing uh, an airline that would, is going to cause X noise from causing X plus noise. It's going to be the same noise because it's the same airplane. Is that basically right? I think so, yes. Okay. I, it, it comes down to, and I won't beat the dead horse here, but pick the ABC airline. Monday th through Wednesday, they flew out of there as an E-class because they could go through one through seven and had no particular problem. The fourth 
fourth day, a new monitoring system is put in there. They flow the exact same weight airplane. It's flying out of there exactly. But now that plane exceeds the Class E class, it can no longer fly. It's been restricted in flying potentially a Class E aircraft. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Tom. Can uh, I Mayor for Tim Dixon. So just to clarify your comment earlier, Mayor and staff, so tonight we obviously we've just been discussing the new noise microphones. To address the community's questions about the flight path issue, how would you suggest we inform the community what should be done or what the current status is. The city has communicated to the county, who's going to communicate to the FAA. Should we clarify that a little bit so the community understands where the council is in terms of our policy? I could chime in a little bit, Mayor Bertem Dixon. Um, council Member Petro says two things on the uh, items which the council member council would like should address, and two of them relate to John Wayne. One of them, if you choose to address that, does ask the the council and the community to weigh in more about fanning versus narrowing. And to me, that's that's the opportunity. And, uh, at the same time, if folks are listening at home, they should, if they feel strongly, comment on the environmental assessment by, well, they've got to get it in now. Today's the day. But, and they could also read our letter where I think we kept the door open for uh, many of our concerns. That's Mayor Petros. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And uh, please accept my uh, apologies for being tardy. I had another business meeting I had to attend to. Uh, I would have you note, though, that we have had a very robust discussion at the Aviation Committee meetings. I brought those back, uh, reports back to this council. Uh, there were, this chamber was filled with people who had an interest, expressed an interest uh, in what is happening with uh, flights. As a result of some changes to uh, the magnetic north reading and a recalibration and renumbering of the runways, there has been an, I don't want to call it an error, but a, a, a change in the, the takeoffs that is being remedied. It is recognized as a problem that needs to be addressed and that will be addressed absent the discussion on Metroplex, absent the discussion on noise monitors, fanning, or concentration. However, as a result of the Aviation Committee meetings, if you'll re remember, I brought back the desire to have us weigh in on the position expressed in or the lack of a position expressed in our uh, council policy related to the departures at John Wayne. Tonight you will have that opportunity to decide whether you want to take that up and we can have that discussion at a subsequent uh, meeting. So that is what is uh, before us. But as I have replied to many of my neighbors and, and uh, the residents uh, affected by the, the airport, we all need to realize that the city of Newport Beach has a very, very limited authority as it relates to the goings on at JWA. It's a county facility. It's the county's facility. Once those planes leave the ground, they are no longer in the county's authority. That's an FAA and a federal mandate. So I have been attending meetings at the uh, invitation of Supervisor Steele, and I'm ever grateful for her to, to have me there representing the city of Newport Beach. But when I am there, uh, there's very little that they pay attention to, except maybe the color of my tie. Uh, so uh, we have very little influence on the FAA. We will continue, though, to stay in front of them, and I would hope that we can have that discussion in a subsequent meeting about what we want to do as a matter of policy on behalf of the residents of Newport. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on this one? Okay. Seeing none, uh, public comments on uh, closed session or agenda items. Any additional public comments? Jim? No? Okay. Uh, okay, we'll adjourn to closed session. Do we have a closed session uh, announcement, Mr. City Attorney? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Selich. Uh, the City Council adjourned to closed session to discuss item 4A and B on the closed session agenda. 
including conference with labor negotiators by meeting with Dave Kiff, city manager, Car Carol Jacobs, interim assistant city manager, Terry Cassidy, deputy city manager, and Jonathan Holtzman, who are the city's negotiators, to discuss negotiations with all represented employees, as well as meeting regarding uh, one matter of existing litigation, which is the Kent Moore versus City of Newport Beach matter. Thank you. Okay, so recess to closed session.